Good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, yeah, my name is Anna. Um, I work in the area of the renewable energy now um, in a company called uh, Vestas Wind Systems. And unfortunately, we don't take picture, pictures of uh, supermassive black holes, but um, uh, Vestas is the largest uh, wind turbine energy company in the world. And uh, we do not only uh, build turbines, but we also uh, do a lot of research in trying to find out what is the best place to put up a turbine, a wind power park, uh, combined with solar panels, batteries, and um, uh, basically to, to do that and to do that optimally. So, so we want to optimize and maintain the, the turbines and the solar panels producing energy uh, as much as possible so that, so that we don't have to resort to, to coal. And uh, for that, uh, one thing we need is to know how the wind is blowing, for instance, uh, on a uh, time basis uh, for, with as much resolution as possible, right? So uh, um, in order to do that now, we need to resolve to complex physical simulations that takes hour to, hours to complete. Um, we want to, now, now the market is changing and we need these uh, results uh, very quick because we, we participate in auctions and the bidding needs to be there at the right time. So we want to explore if we can use deep learning instead to uh, obtain these, uh, these uh, estimates. Um, so, uh, well, as, as uh, many of you know, uh, uh, designing uh, or de deciding on the best architecture for a deep learning model, which are the best, the best hyperparameters, is not a trivial task, right? So we have encountered this uh, challenge in many other use cases uh, in Vestas. So, so we decided to just uh, give, it, give it a go and, and, um, and uh, work on our own on-prem solution uh, to, to assist on this problem for several reasons that I will, that I will uh, talk to you about now. Right, so I would like you to look at this uh, small image and think about if you think this is a good piece of art any brave, um, it is, right? Right, oh, good eye. <laughs> it is still, yeah, so people uh, mainly believe it is, uh, objectively believe it is a very good piece of art, and, and it, but it's easy to know when, when you look at the, at the full picture, right? So it's the same thing uh, when, when we are citing, when we are trying to find out what is the, be the best place uh, for, for to put in up a wind power plant. So if we just look at the, at the small picture, it's very difficult to know, right? Uh, it's better to, to have more information. Uh, in this case, uh, what you see here, right, I can point, but right in the middle of the image, there's a measurement tower or met mast that is typically uh, put in promising locations to collect data for at least a year about the wind speed. And uh, if we had an infinite amount of money, we would be putting a uh, met mast uh, all over the place, but we don't, so we need to uh, get uh, very precise information about the, how the wind speed is blowing uh, with as much horizontal resolution as possible. And then once we collect the data from the MET masts, then we also further increase the resolution of, the, of this uh, wind speed's uh, measurement to know uh, about the best layout for the, for the turbines, for instance. So at, at Vestas, we, we already have a product that is called Sidehand that is able to assist, uh, assist on this. So uh, it, it provides a solar or a wind map for a particular area, in this case in a three kilometer resolution. Um, and it is possible to schedule more simulations uh, that, uh, the, so, so the, this triggers a physical simulation that takes hours to run to get further uh, to, to, to pro that, they, who, that provides images in, in a finer resolution, uh, one kilometer, th uh, 300 meters in this case, or even in, in, uh, in higher resolution, 10, 25 meters. But as I said, this, this takes uh, in an increasing amount of time to, to compute, and especially if the terrain is, is complex. Uh, there are other alternatives, uh, statistical alternatives that are much quicker, but uh, and that works uh, very well on 90% of the cases, uh, but fail on the other 10%, uh, particularly where the terrain is, is complex, which is where the where the physical simulations also take longer and and uh, might also fail and have to be rerun. 
so uh, m motivated by this, uh, also carried away by the hype of deep learning, the success but all, that all this uh, deep learning is, is uh, providing in many other uh, tasks uh, that, that are similar to this on data that has a hierarchical structure, just like our wind data, we decided to give it a go. And, um, and then we, we wonder, so what is it that we have at the company that we can use in terms of uh, tools and data? And what is it that we are missing? And that's what I'm uh, going to uh, show you now. So at Vestas, we have a relatively large uh, supercomputer. It was part of the top 500 when we uh, acquired it in 2016, uh, with more than 16 uh, CPU cores and uh, 20 nodes, uh, 20 GPU nodes. Uh, physically, it's divided uh, between the um, uh, data and compute uh, cluster that, uh, uh, that are connected using 50, 56 uh, gigabit connection, infinibit connection, which is rather quick. And, um, and logically, um, uh, it is divided into a, 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 most of the nodes are part of a, a cluster orchestrated by SunGreen Engine. And we have a small uh, Kubernetes cluster and a medium-sized, uh, what we call big data cluster that contains all the um, Spark, Hive, and other tools from the big data ecosystem. And now, and if, if we say HPC is our uh, primary tool, then data for us is our spine. Vestas uh, has the largest uh, Win data uh, library on the uh, Win Energy, um, um, uh, of all the wind energy companies, and uh, that, that is, uh, contains more than 1.5 uh, petabytes of data with uh, tens of terabytes coming every month. And, um, and it, is, uh, it was actually created back in 2012 in ORC format, and uh, it contains historical uh, uh, information about the wind speed and solar uh, information. Uh, in a resolution of uh, horizontal resolution, resolution of three kilometers, hourly point estimates, and um, and uh, you can see it as a three D stream of data because uh, it contains information at, at different uh, heights over the ground. Uh, relevant also for this uh, use case of downscaling wind resources that I'm going to talk to you about is are the elevation and the roughness database. The elevation database contains a uh, high resolution SRT endpoints and the roughness database uh, contains different parameters for the roughness of the terrain. Now, um, if, if we consider just the data from the uh, Vestas Climate Library, this is the kind of information we can get. Uh, we can um, ask uh, ourselves which is the average wind speed in the US at a height of 80 meters above the ground, and we get this, uh, this uh, map uh, where uh, red, reddish uh, warm light colors correspond to higher wind speeds, and colder blue light colors correspond to, to lower average wind, spe wind speeds. Right, not, not, all the, not, not all areas are equally promising for, for wind uh, power, uh, power plants. So we discard those that are higher uh, than 1,500 meters above ground and uh, where the wind speed is lower than three meters per second because you know if the wind is not blowing, the turbine is not producing energy, so it doesn't make sense. Also, we exclude all national parks, protected areas for uh, national forests and federal lands. Also, urban places and uh, airports, and then uh, the, the, um, the surface is, is decreasing for the options to where to put a power plant. And uh, then we also want that uh, the, uh, the uh, wind park is close to the uh, grid, high voltage grid. So we also exclude all the, those, those areas that are farther away uh, than 30 kilometers from the, from the grid. Now, so, so that's, those are the options we, we can explore, right? So we take the most promising ones, and then uh, the, the um, piece of land we need to explore is, is much smaller. But still, there are many places here to put up a met mask. So we need to further downscale this information, this three kilometer resolution uh, um, time series that we have, we need to further downscale it to, to, um, to more finer granularity. So uh, this is the, the uh, data and the 
sort of the technical solution flow that, that uh, the way we see it, it's more logically uh, maybe for us to divide each of the work we've done on the different boxes. And we've done some uh, work on the data extraction part, extracting the data from the three different data sources. Then uh, this uh, uh, data has to be combined. We generate uh, some, we do some feature engineering, engineering to generate extra attributes. And um, then when, this, uh, when the data is ready for the model selection part, we want to distribute the computation of the different configuration for the, param for the parameters on the different nodes of the cluster, right? So uh, this is the part of the training and evaluation and model deployment. So now I'll go deeper into each of these boxes for, the downscaling pro for, for our downscaling problems. Uh, so basically, we have some, right, in the, where we want to uh, downscale the wind resources that we have at three kilometer resolution, and we make it as a supervised problem with some one kilometer uh, resolution points that we have in the area of Saudi Arabia. We have, as I said, three different data sources. Uh, the first one, the uh, data from the Vestas Climate Library, we extract this data using Spark. Um, for the other two smaller data sets, we've just plain Python, basically just reusing what other data scientists uh, were using, as this is uh, our first uh, proof of concept for the problem. To combine these two data sources, uh, we use a uh, Hive, and then also to create some, some attributes or helper functions, uh, such as called Virgins and Laplacian, that, are, uh, that we use to uh, give more information to the algorithm about the uh, wind rotation that could uh, um, uh, mean that there are turbulences. Also, the wind uh, flow um, into a particular point, the surface of a particular point, and, uh, and the wind out of this point as well. Uh, air compression, and uh, basically then use uh, Spark to make uh, extra uh, uh, modifications to this data set, uh, scaling, maybe creating uh, other attributes, and so on. Right, this, this has been a key part for us uh, because um, uh, it, it's also meant how uh, we do the, the data represent, how we uh, select the data representation that is going to be fed to, into our Keras model. Um, we consider these uh, three kilometer points. Uh, we get this from the Vestas Climate Library, and now uh, we need to take into account that the uh, globe is a sphere, the Earth is a sphere, so the data is sort of uh, skewed there as well, not, not uh, ready in this grid-like um, uh, square that, that I show here. So this is, it has required quite a lot of uh, coding and, and, um, and uh, an effort to make it uh, look like, like, a, like a grid or put it in the grid shape. And then so with this first square, we get these uh, three kilometer points. And, um, and this, for each of these points, uh, contains uh, actually uh, has a, uh, 19, it can, it can hold like 19 years of, of, uh, of timestamps, right? Then uh, for our supervised uh, training, we also collect some one kilometer points in the area of Saudi Arabia. We, we, we sort of enhance that with some high resolution uh, information about the heights and also about the, the roughness of the terrain. And each of these, then each of these uh, red points is what it's, uh, it's what we use as a row for our algorithm, right? And remember that it's a, it's a, each of these points it contains a, 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 a different timestamps, right? So it's not a single row, and the rest of the surrounding uh, that the, the surrounding points basically is just padding. Now. Um, here we show some of the, the attributes we have used uh, for our for training. We have the SW down, which is the sun radiation uh, that is hitting the surface. Also the X hour and I hour, those are two extra attributes we, we create from the hour of the day, uh, sort of to help the algorithm understand that, that, that from uh, 13, 11 p.m. there's 12 and then there's 1 a.m., sort of a continuous space. 
Um, the, temper the temperature is also relevant. Of course, U and V, which are the two components of the wind uh, that the meteorologists say uh, we need to use or advise us to use. Um, and, and we compute that from the wind speed and from the wind direction. And also we feed that, we enrich that with the high resolution heights and high resolution roughness. So even though it looks here that we have only seven uh, input attributes, it's actually many more because we have uh, each of these uh, values for each of the red points that you, you, you can see there, right? So for each row in our data set, we have information about the center point, the big red center point, and also the eight red center po points surrounding. We are going to compare this, uh, the results of the deep neural network with the uh, linear regression. And, uh, and that is the data we feed to the linear regression is basically just the height of a at a particular point, U and V in low resolution. And then the target is the U and V in, in high resolution. So uh, the, our first time has been to use a feed forward neural networks. And um, even though it looks as it, it should be simple, straightforward, well, it, it has a lot of hyperparameters to tune, uh, right? This on the left, you can see a, a picture or a screenshot of a JSON file that we use in, in our uh, framework. And basically, I'm just showing it here because it contains the hyperparameters it's fine. It contains the hyperparameters uh, that we want to evaluate. And in this case, we've just uh, specified that we want to test four different hyperparameters for the number of neurons, uh, three different hyperparameters for the number of hidden layers, two for the uh, size of the batch, uh, the batch size, and uh, two for the proportion of uh, or the percentage of the dropout. And that alone, that we thought was still small, I mean, we, we, want to, we want to explore more, that leads to 48 different combinations. So the, the first thing we realized is that we wanted to take advantage of the supercomputer or of the nodes, and um, even better, from the GPU nodes of the supercomputer to evaluate all these different configurations and more. Uh, so we explore what were the options uh, in terms of tools that were out there to, for us to use. Uh, Talos was close enough, but not uh, perfect because we wouldn't be able to uh, scale across nodes. So it was multi-threading, so not good enough. Uh, Qflow, uh, not really that mature. MFlow, uh, back then it was uh, a bit the same. LFS. Uh, pretty much the same, and in general, nothing fits our uh, sort of uh, our or uh, orchestrator on the on the supercomputer. So we ended up uh, building our own uh, solution, and and that solution involves that we we provide a JSON file in the shape that you saw it before, with the location of the database, the um, the different hyperparameters uh, you want to use input and output uh, attributes to be considered. And uh, that is fed into the, the, our software that uses uh, Talos to convert these uh, different hyperparameters into all possible combinations. That is used by the scheduler to send all these different configurations to the different nodes, one per node, with the, also with the path of the data. And, uh, and everything is computed in parallel, and we are able to check uh, using TensorFlow how the learning curves are, are going, whether we want to stop one of them, uh, some of them, and also in the end to select which is the best model that we want to, to keep. We also have a, a, a script to basically tell us what was the best result phone, um, and also use visual inspection of the, of the results, how actually the wind speed is looking in comparison with, with the real truth. Um, but it's, it, we find it very important to explore also the learning curves to avoid just uh, being overfeeding or, or uh, things like that. Now, what, what we do is to divide the, the data sets in uh, between training, validation, and test, so the classical split. 
and use the training data set for, for training uh, the, the, on the hyperparameter exploration. The validation section is used to select the best uh, set of hyperparameters. And then in the end, we, set, we take the best model training on, uh, use the training and validation part to, to train that one. And then the test portion is used uh, along with the, with the results on the linear regression to uh, uh, compare the two, uh, the two algorithms. As evaluation measures, we are using mean absolute error, root mean square error, so all the classical ones, uh, Pearson correlation coefficient, bias, and also we have implemented uh, uh, one measure to compare the cumulative distribution function of the, uh, the, the the differences between the C CDF, uh, basically. And now the million dollar, the million dollar question. So, so do we downscale? So we have uh, considered the area of Saudi Arabia because we happen to have a lot of one kilo, well, basically uh, the, all the area, we, we have all the one kilometer resolution points for, for the whole country. So we have selected four different points um, uh, <coughs> That, are, uh, that have very different wind roses and actually very different terrain, uh, some close to the coast. And uh, I don't know about you, but I thought uh, when, when uh, I was told that we, we would need to work in Saudi Arabia, I thought ah, that might be a bit boring, right? I mean, all this like uh, country, I mean, will it be challenging enough? But then when I saw the map and I, struck, I started to, to look at the data, well, it's really uh, more challenging than, than, you, than you would imagine. Now, so in this plot, what, what you're seeing is the uh, high resolution uh, terrain information for a particular uh, um, area with a 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer, um, a 20 by 20 kilometer area. And the same information using the uh, high resolution points. So the first one is only using the three kilometer. This is using the, only the three kilometer heights and this is the one kilometer heights. And, uh, and in this case, it doesn't matter because the, the, it's pretty flat, but we will see that on more complex terrain, it really matters. And this is what uh, the results of uh, running complex physical simulations. So we consider to be the truth sort of, even though it's still simulations. The green uh, uh, wind vectors correspond to three kilometer resolution and the black to one kilometer resolution. So I really challenge you to think if you, you think it would be possible to downscale just using the to one kilometer resolution, just using the uh, information about the three kilometer resolution. I mean, the diagonal bump in the middle, I think that would be pretty hard to, to capture. And that's what we see uh, when, when we uh, use the linear model. Uh, the uh, uh, black arrows are the, the results, the wind uh, uh, speed estimator, and the red points are just the residuals, the error between the magnitude of the differences. Now, if we compare with the neural network model, well, the results are better, but still not, not great. I mean, it's able to capture the, bab the bump a little bit better. Um, but if we look at another, this just corresponds to a one timestamp. If we look at another timestamp, we see that uh, this would be a very easy example, right? And the, the uh, neural network model is, uh, uh, returns almost no, no errors in this case. Looking at the results from all the, the test data set, uh, then we can see how we, uh, the deep neural network can beat the uh, linear regression in all, of, in all measures. But the interesting part is that just using the closest three kilometer point, um, we, uh, the differences of the CDFs are actually smaller. And that is because it's able to capture the extreme winds uh, better than the new deep neural network. Now let's uh, look at a more complex terrain. Um, this is the, uh, the information from the high resolution terrain database where you can really see that there's a difference between the three kilometer and the one kilometer uh, points. And that, this is what we consider to be the reference uh, data, the real truth, inverted commas. Now the linear model is very much lost, right? It's, it's not able to, to capture this uh, big red part on the um, southeast. And 
again, the neural network, even though it's, it's not perfect, is able to capture that part a bit better than the, than the linear model. And that's what we are seeing in most of the, of the timestamps. And this is just for you to see how uh, amazing and beautiful this problem is, right? I mean, capturing this flow of wind is really not uh, obvious. And we see both methods struggling, neural network, promising results, but still uh, we would like to do better, right? And the quantitative results um, show uh, basically this. Yes, we are beating the, the baselines, uh, except for this particular case of the bias, where probably errors are compensating each other. Uh, but in general, uh, it looks like uh, it provides better results, but um, yeah, not sure if, I mean, not quite there yet to be put into production. So uh, to ask this question again, so do we downscale? Where? Not, not quite yet. And uh, that's what we are still working on this. We have built the, um, the foundation, the technical solution to continue to work on this. Uh, we see that we can beat the statistical, uh, the baseline, the statistical solution for the, for the baseline. Uh, but we, uh, we think we're ready now to move to convolutional neural network. And this is also a time component to our, to our problem. So we would like to combine that with recurrent neural network as well, networks as well. Also test different evaluation scenarios. So we most likely the, the way this is going to work in production in the end uh, will be that we will be training the neural network on um, different samples, uh, different areas from the globe. And then when it's, when it's time to do inference, when it is time to downscale, we will be um, updating this model, some sort of transfer learning, with uh, data from, from that particular locations when it, location where we need to downscale. And that is something we need to, to further explore. Also test even higher resolution terrain information and not equally um, in, the, in the same resolution as the terrain, we, as the one we want to downscale to. And, uh, and uh, also doing some optimization and more automation to the end-to-end -end, uh, cycle um, technical in the technical solution part. We we have so so the um, the value chain in investors is a complex one, and we have a lot of different use cases where we can potentially use uh, machine learning and deep learning, um, such as uh, power forecasting. Uh, we've seen this example in the uh, keynote speech today. Um, Long-term correction of the wind, um, troubleshooting the turbine errors, condition monitoring. So we, we really hope that this uh, platform can be used in, in some of these other uh, use cases as well. This is the Glamorous team who's been working on this. Um, my colleague uh, Tial Yalte, Hans, who is sitting here, you can uh, direct all the complex questions to him and, uh, and Tiago. And uh, that's basically it. Thanks, Anna. Awesome. Thanks. Questions? Thank you. Um, how do you, um, yeah, first of all, thanks for a nice uh, presentation. I'm Eric from Vattenfall, one of your cooperation partners uh, or competitors, depending, depending on how you see it. Um, I'm interested in knowing how you f feed in the terrain information, the topology into your network. Maybe you covered it, but I, I couldn't understand. Uh, so it's, it's uh, basically, it just attributes uh, just as attributes on the row for now to the fit for one neural network, right? So it's basically flattened to the, uh, this, the, uh, I can use the. Uh, like that picture you had there with the mountains and stuff. <laughs> How do you get that one into your neural network? That's kind of a the simplification of my question. No, what is part of the neural network is actually the uh, ones right that's not into the, what is into the neural network is this one, this point from the high resolution terrain database. Okay, so only wind speeds. Uh, sorry? O only wind speeds or also? Yeah, also the heights, also the heights. 
from the SRTM uh, database. The height that is uh, uh, that is here and that the is the terrain height uh, above sea level. The terrain height exactly okay. and the roughness. That is what we are seeing here, right? So using uh, the, actually the one kilometer heights. Mm. Because yeah, I would be interested to understand how you capture different wind speeds when you have sort of a ridge of a mountain and I mean there must be lots of stuff like that going on. Yes, we, we need to sort of uh, look closer and see because in some of, some of the parts where the terrain is, is tricky, roughness, uh, we, we need to drill down and see what is that we are missing, that we are capturing. But we also understand we are ready now to go to convolutional. We think it's in nature, it, it resembles more uh, like local patterns that we want to be capturing. Also that is, uh, is agnostic to rotation of the images uh, that we have, and, and we are not going to invest more time in, in actually looking at the results of this, but just moving to convolutional altogether and, and actually uh, uh, looking much more at the, at the results there. Then uh, good luck with that. <laughs> yes, thanks. <laughs> Any other questions? I actually have questions, a couple of questions. Okay. Um, you did this on-prem. Is yes. there, maybe I missed that part, so is there any reason that you stick on on-prem instead of going on cloud? Uh, well, the data is on-prem, mm -hmm. right? That's uh, the main reason for now. Uh, there's no plan for now to move it on the cloud. Um, and then we have the GPUs that we barely use, so the CPUs, the utilization of the HPC is very high on the, GP, on the CPUs, but not so much on the GPUs, so we really, uh, there was a boy there that we wanted to basically uh, uh, feel and it's, it's cheap, it's already there, so. Uh. And second question, do you have any um, uh, best practices in terms of uh, increasing the performance of the neural network when you're running in on GPU? Right, so the, the way we've done it now, the database is small, so it fits in memory, and we, at, at most, it can scale to the two GPUs, uh, GPUs we have on the node. And we basically just installed it using pip, so we've not done any smart, maybe optimization installation. We haven't stolen the so from the source or anything like that. And the reason for that is also that it, it is important for us that it's easy to maintain. So uh, we really need to have, uh, with sim performance, is, is, if performance is all right, um, actually compared to we haven't, uh, for the simple fit forward networks that we've been training compared to using 28 CPU uh, cores, the speed up we've seen is uh, around three. Uh, these uh, GPUs are not uh, rather old, maybe compared to, I mean, it could be newer. So, so we think it's all right for, at least for the needs we see now. Yeah. But maybe there's room for improvement, probably. If you, anyone, any other questions? No? Can I ask the last question? Yes. I noticed that you kept your batch size at 200, if I'm not mistaken. Is there any reason for that? Because if your uh, GPU has more memory, why don't you use no, more? No, actually price? there's room for more memory, and that's something that we okay. are planning to increase. Okay. Yes. Awesome.